Welcome to the Burrard Public Library. I'm Elena, the Assistant Director. Tonight, uh, we have Linnea Hartsiker with us, and she's going to be talking about her book, The Sea Queen. And I promised I would not say too much about her, because that's what she's going to be talking about. Um, but I did read a, a great description of her book that I wanted to share first. Um, it says, The Sea Queen is an epic Viking saga filled with the excitement, romantic adventure, political intrigue, violence, and rich history that have made Diana Gabaldon's Outlander, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, Philippa Gregory's historical fiction, and Neil Gaiman's North Mythology popular bestsellers. A seamless fusion of real-life figures and vivid imagination, the Sea Queen takes us to the fjords and halls of Viking Age Scandinavia, a world of carnage and prophecy, where a beguiling cast of characters must contend with bitter rivalries, shifting allegiances, and the will of the gods in their pursuit of land, power, justice, and freedom. Which sounds very exciting. <laughs> Thank so you. Please welcome Linnea to talk about her book. Right. Say how if it feels weird to stand up here, but I think I think it'll be. I usually stand when I do these things. I think I think I'm gonna do that. But if I just sit down, that might happen too. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for um, for having me here at the Berwick Library. It's it's uh, just past. I haven't driven particularly this way before, but I've driven through Berwick before on my way to Maine. I live in Dover now, um, uh, but I grew up in Ithaca, New York, and. Um, and spent most of my adult life in New York City, and just recently moved to Dover in last July. So I am, I am really enjoying it here. It's been a gorgeous spring so far. We put in fruit trees. I have a house now instead of a tiny apartment. So it's been really nice to be up here. I drove through like seven different weather systems on the in the <laughs> seven mile drive up here. It was raining. There was it was sunny. It was over. Anyway, it was great. Uh, I studied engineering at Cornell, actually, and got my undergrad in engineering. And then um, after living and working in New York and working in internet startups for a while, I got an MFA in creative writing from NYU. Um, and then thereafter published my first novel, The half Drowned King, and the sequel, The Sea Queen, and the third book of the, and final book of the trilogy is coming out in August and is called The Golden Wolf. Um, Unlike George R. R. Martin, I am ending the series, and then I'm going to move on to something else. Uh, so actually, I, I, it's been advertised that I'm going to talk about the Sea Queen, but I don't think any of you have read The half Drowned King, have you? So I'll talk about that because it's the first book in the trilogy. People who have read the second one as a standalone have said that it's good, but you know, you can start with the first one. Um, so I will talk about that. Uh, so. So it's set in, it's a trilogy set in Viking Age Norway, which is, um, and the early part of the Viking Age, which is around 850 AD. And at the time, um, at the time, the Scandinavian kingdoms were, were pagan. They were, they also didn't have any written language. So I can talk a little bit afterwards if people are interested about the research process into a time when there's very few primary sources about the Vikings, a few, but not many. Um, it's also a time when even the notion of like nations and kings were very, were kind of new ideas. And so it follows the rise of the first king of Norway, Harold the fair haired. Um, and, but it's, but he's a secondary character. The main characters are, um, Ronvald and his sister Svanhild. It follows the story of Ronvald who on his way home from a raiding trip in Ireland, um, his captain tries to kill him and throws him overboard. And Ronvald discovers that his stepfather is behind this attempted murder and in the process of confronting him comes to the notice of Norway's kings, including young Harold Fairhair who has ambitions to conquer and unite all of Norway. Um, it also follows his sister Svanhild in kind of alternating chapters. Uh, she's trying to escape a marriage she doesn't want, and her, her escape route leads her into the arms of Ronvald's most powerful enemy. Um, so they end up on opposite sides of the battle for the future of Norway. Uh, so the reason that I, I have a lot of half-finished novels from my early days of starting to be a writer that will never ever see the light of day. Um, but I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to write these books, and that is because when I was a teenager, my, um, my family did a bunch of genealogical research and discovered that we were descended from, um, from Harold Fairhair, the first king of Norway. And so I was really, really excited about that. My mom was more excited to meet like our second and third and fourth and fifth cousins. And one of my party tricks now because of that is like, 
If you tell me it's your grandmother's cousin's daughter, I can tell you who that is to you. Uh -huh. um, which is, let's see, grandmother's grandmother's cousin, that's her first cousin, it's your mother's second cousin, it's your first cousin once removed. Wow. <laughs> so that is, I, this is like a party trick that I pulled out at my, um, when I got married, my, all, my, all my husband, my husband is a huge family, but they're all cousins, like whether they're related or not, or who, it's just all cousins, and so I'd be like, no, she's here, da 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 da. Um, and, but I also, my mom was a, is a geneticist and she, or she was a research scientist in plant genetics, but knew enough about human genetics to be able to say, like, you share less than one chromosome with Harold the fair haired. It's not that <laughs> exciting. And actually then when I did more genealogical research, I realized that I'm sure you are all descended from Harold the fair haired too. He had many wives, many of whom you will meet in the books and, um, and many children and they all went on to have many children and just like almost everyone in the world is descended from Charlemagne now at some point most people will probably be descended from uh, Harold the fair haired and a lot of people are descended from Ronvald too I've gotten a lot of emails from people who are very excited about that and I don't rain on their parade but <laughs> you are probably all descended from Ronvald too I probably am as well I just don't know that particular branch um, so the, the main source for the stories um, that I filled in a lot of, of gaps, but the main source is the Heimskringla written by Snorri Sturluson, in, um, who's writing about 300 years later in Iceland. And it's really interesting reading because he, he's writing sort of to flatter the, um, the kings of Norway, but also Iceland was was Europe's first democracy in many ways. And so they were kind of independent from Iceland, from Norway, but very dependent on it in some ways. And so, um, so he, the, there's a lot of ambivalence about kingship in the Heimskringla, which I thought was really interesting. And I, I think there's a lot of ambivalence about kingship in these books as well. Um, so, and when I first started reading the novel, I mean, reading the history, I was really interested in Harold because I was descended from him, but in the histories, and hopefully this is not spoiling too much, he just wins every battle. He's the best, and he's prophesied, and he wins every battle. And I got, began to feel like that made for a pretty boring character. I was more interested in a character who, who didn't win every battle, who had to sacrifice a lot to, to gain what he did, and then had the potential to lose it. And so, um, so I ended up focusing on, on Ronvald, who is a real historical character, and his sister Svanhild, about whom only uh, one of her a marriage that she has is known about, and, um, and her name, and that she's Ronvald's sister. So I got to make up a lot about her, which was really fun. Uh, so I'm going to do a short reading, and then love to chat. I will sit down, and then love to chat more, and answer questions, and, um, and if anyone's interested in the book, or taking a card to learn more on my website. Uh, so, so it's really hard to find a good reading to do, especially from a book of fiction with lots of interconnected parts that's not like doesn't really lend itself to short stories. So I had a uh, writing teacher at NYU who said, if you can, let's see, if you can be funny, be funny. I, I can sometimes be funny, but it's the books, there's a few jokes, but it's, it's not super funny. Um, and if you can read a sex scene, you should read a sex scene. I'm like, well, I don't really, I don't really want to read a sex scene out loud. But then her third um, piece of advice was, if you can read something violent, read something violent. So that is what I have done, um, because there is plenty of violence in these books. The Vikings were not peaceful people. So at this point in the novel, I just want to give you some background. Um, Ronvald's been deprived of his birthright, and he's, he's sailing around looking for gold and renown. He's in the service of King Hakon, who is the ruler of all of northern Norway at this point. Um, He's traveling with Hakon and his sons. The two you need to know for this reading are Hemming, who is his oldest and favorite son, who is known as um, Hemming Peacock in the, the saga because he dressed so well, uh, and Hakon's um, bastard son, Odi. Uh, on an island along the coast, they encounter a draugr, which is a Norse zombie. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and this section, none of you have read it, but when you do get to it, I've edited it to make it go faster, to make it read better out loud. Um, 
because there's things I wish I'd done differently and I can't change it now, but I can change it when I'm reading it to you. So I made some edits even today, but that also my writing teacher, um, Emily Barton, who is a lovely writer in her own right, that was some advice she had. She's like, don't be scared about editing it to make it read better out loud. Just, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> This is like eight to 10 minutes. Um, oh. King Hakon's ship stopped at a farm on the island of Smola at the mouth of Trondfjord. His warriors ate around the hall's central long fire that night. Hakon and his steward, Rathi, spoke of farm business for a time and whether his prize mare could bear another foal. When the women were clearing the trenchers away to feed the pigs, Ronvald heard Rathi say, there's a more pressing matter I would trouble you with. Remember Helgen, the wise woman? Hakon nodded. Her son was lately killed in a raid upon our coast, said Rothi. A raid, Hakon replied. I had not heard. Some old rovers without enough to do, Rothi said. He was a stooped, bald man with a protruding chin that gave his face a petulant expression. We sent them off smarting. Only Helgen's son was killed. And, Hakon asked, and now he will not stay dead, said the steward. A thrill of fear traveled up Ronvald's spine. Helgen would not consent to have him burned, Rothi continued, and instead put him in a barrow as though he were a king. Now this white walks at night, and the peasants are frightened. Kill the sorceress and have done with it, said Hakon. Ronvald flinched. His imagination showed him a vision of a bloodied sword through the throat of a woman who had only tried to save her son. When she died, she did not cry out, but instead spoke Ronvald's name. We did, of course, said Rothi, his voice sounding to Ronvald as if it filtered to him through seawater. But the creature still walks. The sorceress has a daughter whom we have not found. Ronveld felt as though the sea goddess was drawing him down into her darkness, fjord waters closing over his head, to whisper things in his ear that he did not wish to know. He felt he could not allow the killing of this daughter, the white sister. Has the thing killed anyone, Ronveld asked? No, said Rothi, but he is armed, and these creatures, first they feed on the blood of animals and grow monstrous by it, then it will kill our children, women, and when it is strong enough to kill our grown men, it will be too late for any but a god to stop it. Hakon looked worried. How was this man killed before, Ronvald asked. He took an axe to the skull, said Rothi. The sorceress Helgen packed the wound with moss and cobwebs and said mighty spells over him, and though he should lie still, the dead man walks. She said she was only trying to cure him when we put the question to her. Rathi laughed, a mirthless sound, as though a man can be cured of being dead once the thread of his life is cut. Someone should kill the creature, Ronvald said without thinking, not the sister. If the magic lives beyond the mother, then killing her will only make it angrier. Who, you? Rathi asked rudely. Not me, said Ronvald, though his protest was lost when Hakon's son Hemming began talking over him. Not Ronvald alone, he said. I will kill this thing, father, and if I fall, Ronvald can stand in my stead. Hakon shook his head at his son. I would not risk you. Hemming looked lost for a moment, and Ronvald pitied him. Then Hakon gave Ronvald a considering look. It is a brave suggestion. You may go and see to the white if you take my son Odie with you instead. I did not mean to, said Ronvald, then trailed off without refusing. He should have stayed silent before. Now, between Rothi's ill temper and Hemming's ambition, they had volunteered him for this task. He was one of Hakon's men, and Hakon protected his people. Odie wore an expression that might have made Ronvald laugh under other circumstances. He could not seem to decide whether to be glad of his father's notice or scared of what they must do. The white comes out on cloudy nights, said Rothi. Perhaps you'll see him tonight. This close to midsummer, the sun barely dipped below the horizon at night, but a gathering storm lent a false darkness to the field where the white sparrow stood. Odie walked half a pace behind Ronvald as he circled the mound, examining it. The earth had been dug up. The whether the creature had done that or his hunters, Ronvald did not know. You're always getting yourself into trouble, said Odie. Why did you agree to this? I didn't, said Ronvald. Did not object either, Odie protested, and now this brute is going to kill us. I hope some of Rathi's thrall maidens will weep over our terrible fate. It's too late for me now. I'll look a coward if I go back. Ronvald had ample time to regret opening his mouth since dinner. Still, he felt a stir of hope. In the tales, the monster killed the band of men and fell to a lone hero's blade. A breeze fluttered the heads of the wildflowers in the field. Small white motes closed up in the dark. The strange low light made every blade of grass on the mound stand out in sharp relief. Ronvald touched his sword. I don't like it here, said Odie. You don't have to stay, Ronvald replied. Odie's fear could infect him easily, he knew, if he listened rather than focusing on the task ahead. Maybe I'm supposed to do this on my own, Ronvald added. Have you turned prophet, Odie asked. 
Ronvald's vision of the sorceress seemed like a fancy now that he was out in the cold. If he had not spoken up, he could be sleeping tonight, finally resting in a bed that did not sway with the sea's currents. What now? Odie asked, after Ronvald was silent for a moment. We wait, said Ronvald. It will show itself soon. After a time, the wind began to rise. It lashed Ronvald's hair around his face, carrying moisture to his lips that tasted of salt. Ronvald began to shiver and could not make himself stop. Sorceresses commanded the sea. Perhaps he had been hasty to sympathize with the white's dead mother. Out of the wind and driving rain, it came. A silhouette at first against the charcoal sky. It lurched over the uneven ground. It had been a big man in life, broad and bearded. Now the face seemed dark, the beard matted. Ronvald stood staring at it for a moment before recovering enough to draw his sword. It is real, said Odie. Ronvald thought he could hear Odie's nervous swallow, even over the sound of the wind. A draugr. Yes, said Ronvald with a bravado he did not feel, and I'm going to kill it. Ronvald advanced on the thing, sword in front of him. It moved slowly. He shuffled forward until he was close enough that he could touch it with his sword and smell its terrible stench. It made small animal snuffling noises and gave off the heat of a man. The draugr's forehead was nearly split in half by the axe blow that had killed it. Black blood stained its cheeks. It pawed at its face as if trying to wipe the marks away. Ronvald put his sword to the draugr's neck. Would it do anything if he cut its throat, or would it only continue? Fear stayed his hand. Ronvald's stomach twisted when he saw the white of skull through the layers of clotted blood and leaves. Its skin bore the marks of a hasty washing. Someone living had cared for this creature, and recently, the sister. The draugr raised its axe. Ronvald could easily dodge the blow, but fear and a strange fascination rooted him where he was until the blade whistled near him. The axe glanced off a rock. A blow from its fist caught Ronvald on the shoulder and he stumbled back. It swung again, and this time Ronvald raised his sword to block the blow. It drove the flesh of its forearm down onto the blade. Ronvald recoiled in horror. The draugr did not feel pain. It could grab him. It could use him to feed its terrible hunger. But it did not. It stared down at him, tilting its head like a raven about to rend carrion. It could not feel Ronvald's sword when it swung his arms. How could Ronvald kill it? The grass crunched behind him, Odie coming forward to take up Ronvald's fight if he fell. He could not let Odie die in his place. He found his feet again, but stayed in a low crouch. The white was still above him, swaying where it stood. Ronvald raised his sword and drove it up into the creature's throat. It fell just as a man would, hands scrabbling at the weapon, although unlike a man, it closed its hands around the sword, cutting into its palms, sending blood showering down on Ronvald. Ronvald tried to avoid it, for the blood of a jogger was cold bile, cursed, but it sprayed on him from the creature's mouth, the wound at its throat and arms. Blood covered Ronvald's face and his hands where they were stuck with fear and shock to the hilt of his sword. The jogger's limbs shuddered one last time, and Ronvald scrambled out of the way so it would not fall on top of him. He knelt next to the body. A saga hero would probably have spent less time on his rear, he thought. He had no fear of contagion now. All his fear had drained away, leaving only weariness behind. He began the bloody work of cutting the head from the body, severing tendon and muscle. He grew tired halfway through the neck, sick of gore and too weak to do it neatly, so Odie came and helped him with the last cuts. I will tell my father of your bravery, Odie said, a hint of awe in his voice. You would have done it too, said Ronvald. The white's blood has started to become tacky on its skin. Perhaps Rothy's thralls would heat some water for him, feed him spiced wine, and wash him clean. Perhaps a comely thrall would warm his bed tonight. Ronvald tried to feel excitement at that idea, but he was too slaked with blood and his own fear sweat to imagine touching a woman now. No, said Odie, I would not. I do not seek fame. He looked as though he expected Ronvald to recoil in horror at his unmanliness, but Ronvald did not feel like judging any man. He had killed no more than a dumb beast tonight. He was no braver than Odie. Um, so, so it's been fun to kind of to find the things like, you know, why would they have believed that, that there were zombies who could walk around after they were dead? And it may have been because of, um, of things like this. So, and uh, my, my publisher, my publicist would be annoyed if I did not mention the book is available. It's from HarperCollins. It's available in, um, in audiobook form if people prefer that. It's also available on Kindle and it's also published in six other countries. So if you know people who speak Spanish or German or uh, Dutch or Italian or French who would like to read it, that is also possible. So now I would love to, to chat some more, answer some questions. No, so that's, that is a good question, which is um, it was 
it was a little disappointing during the sales process. Like there was, there was four weeks when I was like Germany, then the U.S., then the U.K. It was like it was so great. And then I um, and I heard from my agent that they, she tried to sell it in a bunch of Scandinavian countries, and they um, they said that, that while they really liked it, they didn't want to publish a. Um, a book, they didn't publish books about Vikings that weren't by local Scandinavian authors. So, so they're like, you sure she's not like really Swedish, not just descended from Swedes and Norwegians? So like, no, she's, she's pretty American. Like, it's been three generations. She doesn't speak Swedish. So, yeah. No, not, not Norwegian. Yeah? Me? Yes, you. Okay. Hillary. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the great crowd. A couple, a couple. So who, who have, did you, Jerry? Your audiobook, are you reading it or did you have somebody else read it? Or? It is a, um, a British man who my sister says sounds a little bit like Michael Caine. So, nice. But when I was um, tasked with choosing the audiobook reader, they sent me some samples to listen to and they were all British men. And I wrote back and I was like, so I guess it's got to be a British man. And they said, like, um, that people who consume a lot of audiobooks would very much expect a book like this to be narrated by a British man. But since I kind of hear it in my own voice, I was like, and in my head, I sound a lot more like Rachel Maddow than I do probably to you guys. I was like, someone with like a, a nice woman with a low, like mid-Atlantic mid voice should read it. But, um, but I polled enough people also who agreed with that. So I just picked the least posh sounding of the British author uh, readers. Because they also did like Masterpiece Theater, which like I grew up listening to and I love, but but, but this is like Vikings. I didn't want it to be. I didn't want it to sound like someone who was on their way to a tea party. Yeah, so, yeah, right. uh, yeah. You started to talk about the research. Uh, this is before written history. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about. Uh, sure. About these people? Yeah. So. Um, so the, actually, there, the few primary sources about the Vikings are from people who encountered them. So there's um, the Viking Age is said to begin in 793 with the attack on the monastery at Lindisfarne. Um, and the monks wrote about how awful it was to be attacked by Vikings. So we have some glimpse of them from that. Um, and then a little later in the 800s, there were, in 900s, there were Arab explorers from Baghdad and, and the the kingdoms there, which were incredibly advanced compared to Europe, and they wrote some narratives. So Ibn Fadlan is the most famous of the um, the explorers who who went to the Norse lands and and came back and wrote about it. Um, so those are those are mostly what we have for like contemporaneous primary sources. Uh, Harold gets mentioned a few times in a few um, like monks chronicles from the uh, Holy Roman Empire in Germany. But, um, but a lot of, and then I mentioned the, the Icelandic writers who are writing 300 years later. So, so I sort of liken that to, if you looked at our, um, if, you, if you looked at our media in 300 years, you might think like if you looked at a lot of action movies that everyone was super buff and got in lots of car crashes and fights all the time. And you would not be correct. You would know something. But so I view like a lot of the Icelandic saga writing, especially the ones where they talk about draugars and heroes and vengeance and oaths and blood feuds. It's like, I'm sure that happens sometimes, but I imagine it wasn't all the time. Probably if you were always in blood feuds, you would just like wipe each other out. Probably not everyone was honorable all the time. So yeah, it's like, I take it with a grain of salt. But then there's also a lot of great archaeology that's been done. And so that's what I based a lot of my like, understanding of what what it was actually like to live there and the stuff that's been been dug up but even that like some of the interpretation has been interesting and changed over time like they the, there's a fame pr pretty famous case of they thought it was a man's grave because it was a woman who'd been buried with a sword for a long time and based a lot of things on um on thinking that, that it was a man's grave, and then finally DNA testing revealed that it was a woman. And then some people went really far the other direction and said, oh, she was a woman warrior, but that was pretty uncommon, and she was a pretty high-status woman. It was unlikely that she was a warrior, but she may have been holding a sword in trust for her son, and um, high-status widows could command troops, but they rarely like actually wielded the weapons because you had to be young and strong and have trained at that for a long time and women just generally didn't have those opportunities. Um, but yeah, so a lot of archaeology and then I visited the, a lot of the places that I talk about in the books, including 
yeah. Um, in fact, the, I didn't real. I went on a, a sea kayaking trip in Norway, and I just wanted to sort of see the fjords of Norway in general. But once I dug, and that was at the very early stages of doing this, but when I dug into the research more, I realized that the fjord that we had kayaked down, like the entire length of, was the fjord where a bunch of major battles that I wanted to write happened. So like, I talk about there's a, um, there's a like, up in a cliff, it looks like a warrior's face, just the way the, and probably that wasn't there 1,200 years ago because rock weathers a lot faster than that, but, but I put it in there anyway. So sure. yeah. yeah, it was a good detail. I liked it. So yeah, that's, um, that's some of the research. It sounds like one of your characters, uh, what was that line? A saga hero wouldn't spend so much time on his butt. Yeah. yeah. So is the, the saga is like a real historical story. Yeah, and I've sort of used that word interchangeably with like legends and other, mm -hmm. um, but but much like kind of ancient Greek culture, Vikings were really concerned about how their, um, they didn't believe so much in an afterlife. They're sort of almost joking things about like being buried next to each other so that they could talk after their like friends would get buried, so they could like talk in their graves. Or they would come out as droggers who had, um, were zombies with, with violent appetites. Um, but they did care about their, uh, their legacy living on, their name living on after them. So they wanted to be remembered in songs and, and poems and sagas. And so, so a lot of them like care, think a lot about that in the book. It's kind of neat the way it reflected, you know, you're reading a story about somebody thinking about a story. Yeah. Well, and it's funny writing about a group of people who didn't, I mean, reading is such a huge part of my life that it's odd to write about um, people who were illiterate. And so, so I, the, but they do care a lot about stories, so that was my way in, that they, just because they didn't, you know, sit down and read a book didn't mean that they didn't think about stories and, and model themselves after them and, and kind of put themselves imaginatively into stories all the time. They just didn't have the, the written word to do it. But it's also kind of a problem with sending, um, with like the action, like you can't even send a note to someone in the, in, like runes were, were not really used for that sort of thing. They were used for religious purposes and, and writing markers. So you're not even like, you can't even send a messenger with a note. You have to send a messenger with something that they can remember and then you have to really trust the messenger. Spying would have been pretty problematic because you had to talk to your spy in person to, um, to find anything out, so thinking about things like that. As a yeah. child, did you read about Vikings and Norsemen and yeah. was that part of your cultural kind of overlay? Yeah, um, I grew up in the middle of the woods and so um, to get me to like cross country skiing better, my parents like, I mean, that's probably not the only reason, but when I would be pretty miserable on a, like a 10 mile cross country ski trip, I think about uh, Skadi, who's one of the, the Norse goddess of skiing because my dad had read me stories about her. And so yeah, definitely that sort of, um, we had the Dolaire's Norse myths, which is a beautifully illustrated. Um, I think the Greek myths book is more well known, but we had the Norse myths books, which talk about all the Loki and Odin and Thor. And, um, and my mom was real into going to like Swedish festivals and things because we, when I looked at the family, we're like descended from Harold, stayed in um, in Norway. That branch of the family stayed in Norway for for 100 years, then went to Iceland for like 300 years, and then went to Sweden. And so the last like 700 years of my, that side of the family's lineage was in Sweden. So my mom was obsessed with Swedish stuff. So we'd go to Swedish festivals, and no offense to anyone who likes Swedish festivals, but my contention was that all the interesting Swedes had left Norway as Vikings, and that the boring Swedes were the ones who came in, um, in the 1800s and had festivals where like everyone wore braids and made lingonberry jam. So I found them fairly tedious, but I was also a snotty teenager, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you still kind of yeah. <laughs> Do you have relatives in Minnesota? Not in Minnesota, but relatives in Sweden. And um, so when we did that, my, the genealogy, and this was all before, um, this was in like the early 90s, so it was before everything was online. Um, my uncles found like everyone descending from a woman named Alva seven generations back. So they got the entire family tree from there. And so we connected with everyone who was still alive, who was sort of on, you know, the three, in the three generations that were still alive and made a lot of connections in Sweden. Um, I mean, I may have relatives in 
Minnesota, but not that I know of. But yeah, a lot of people went there. It's the Minnesota accent has some. It's very similar to the Swedish accent for a reason. Yeah. How long did it take you to? Uh, th was the story in your head, so it was just formulating as you were going through, or how long does it take you to write a book? Well, the first one um, took a really long time because I was learning how to write a novel in the first place, and um, and. It's sort of like I like having the historical sort of a few historical things to hang a story on, but um, but I need to motivate them. It can't just be like this happened, this happened, this happened. I need my characters to like to have it be meaningful for the characters when they get to that moment to have them have made interesting decisions and sacrifices to get there. And so there's a lot of kind of backwards work from knowing a piece to to getting into it and. Um, but I do like having those. That's been fun about writing historical fiction is I have certain things that, that I can't change. And having those constraints in some ways makes it easier. Um, but so I sold the first book. And I'd only written the first book, but I had a really good idea of where a trilogy would go if I, um, if I was writing a trilogy, if I could sell a trilogy and we did sell a trilogy. And so the, the next two books were written in like a year each, so a lot faster. Oh, wow. Um, because I'd done all the research already and right. um, and had a much better idea where they were going. That said, this uh, the Sea Queen was somewhat easier, although um, my editor did have me cut a lot of one person's point of view out. There's another point of view character who you'll meet. Which person? Um, have you read it? Uh, Sigurd. Oh. Yeah, I'm probably only. That's great. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Sarah is the wonderful librarian that got in touch with you. Oh. Oh, great, wonderful, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, Sigurd had a bigger uh, oh. POV role and then my agent thought, he, I mean my editor thought he was a little dull and we cut it that back a bit. So he had a romance that got cut and... Um, Does he come back stronger in the last book? He doesn't have, he has a little to do in the last book. But the last book in, was a lot harder to write just to like bring everything in for a landing and yeah. um, and I have Ron Vald and Svanhild's children are growing into adulthood so I've given them POV as, as well and so um, so it's getting people have read it so far really like it but it was so much harder to write than book two which I did not expect um, so my agent was very surprised that I got that, you know I agree I signed on the line saying I was going to put a book out a year but she was like people say they're going to do that but they don't usually do it so I was oh. yeah um, <laughs> but I, I like it. And usually I'm a gear towards more fantasy and science mm -hmm. fiction, but you really kept it going and with enough interest that, you know, can, you know, it's like almost magic, but not exactly magic. Well, I do, I love, I love fantasy novels, so I sort of, um, I had fantasy readers in mind in many ways when I was, was writing these. Um, yeah, but I, and I do also love historical fiction novels, yeah. but more, more of the ones with, like, lots of, Battles and political intrigue than some of the um, the more closer to to now historical novels. What was the path to publishing like? How long did it take? Well, there was parts that were really challenging, and parts that went super fast and were awesome. So, um, so I had a had a friend who was my agent, and never have an, your friend be your agent. Um, and she she I will not name any names, but she reps some some well-known fantasy authors and um, and seems to do a good job but for them but we did not mesh well in many ways she would like fall off the map for months at a time and misled me about things she was doing with the book so eventually um, and she t took a lot longer so for anyone who is trying to get published between when an agent says they're interested in your book and back and forth where they help you um, sort of mold it into something they want to sell. Agents do do a lot of editorial work. So, so it's expected that you might take up to nine months to kind of mold the book into a more saleable book. She was still going with me for, th for two years on that. And so I didn't know that at the time, but that's way too long. And that's not, not someone who's very serious about your stuff. Um, and so, 
So eventually she said she was ready and she was publishing, she was sending it out, but then it became clear that she told me she had sent it to editors and had not actually sent it to editors. And at that point I asked to not be her client anymore and I got a lawyer involved and it was all not fun. Um, so it took, that took over a year to kind of end that relationship, but I had met um, my current agent, Julie Bearer, who is fantastic, um, who reps Madeline Miller, who wrote Circe and the Song of Achilles, and Leanne Moriarty, who did Little Big Lies. So she's, she's really great and has a lot of awesome clients. And she, um, she helped me manage the process of getting out of that old relationship. And when she put it on the market, it, it, the German offer came in, in less than a week after it went on the market. And then it was, it was very exciting, like four to six weeks while all the, the offers were coming in. And, um, so, so that part was, that part was easy, but there was, um, which I know it's, it's not for a lot of people that can really vary and lots of best-selling novels have taken nine months to sell. And this is, these are novels are doing fine, but they're not bestsellers. Um, but yeah, that part was easy, but there's, there was the long challenging runway leading up to it. Uh, Do uh, <clears throat> think the whole Thrones thing, I mean, has kind of opened up the receptivity and kind of a broader view that would be uh, more palatable for individuals to get into your books? I think so. I hope so, yeah. And I loved the George R. R. Martin books in, um, in college. And part of the reason, I think I was mentioning earlier, I didn't, I watched the first season and I didn't really continue watching is because it's sort of, it's very hard for something on the screen to like live up to the images I have in my head. And so I didn't feel like the first season really did and so I didn't keep watching it. Um, and I, people told me it got better, but then I also heard about, I prefer violence in books to really, really gross violence on screen. Yeah. So when I heard about some of the things that were portrayed on the screen, I was like, I don't know if I need that image in my head. Yeah. Um, so, so I didn't end up continuing watching it, but I do. I was a was a fan of the books when they were first coming out, and I do hope that it's gotten people because it. I mean, it had a really broad reach, and a lot of people who wouldn't have thought of themselves as fantasy readers or people who are interested in fantasy properties got into it. So I think that's cool. Only sort of epic scope. No dragons in these, though. <laughs> covers are beautiful. I really love them. I've gotten got really lucky with that, and the third one looks great too. Yeah, Patrick Arrowsmith is the um, is the illustrator, and he he's got a great website worth looking at for a lot of cool illustrations. And um, and Milan Bozik is the graphic designer at HarperCollins, who kind of he does like a sketch, and then the illustrator brings it to life. But yeah, I like this so much that I, and I'm allowed to use it for uh, promotional things. So I like very carefully in Photoshop, like took it out and put it on my business card. Very nice, yeah. We were yeah. up in um, Boothbay last summer and there's a, a man, I think it was just one person that built a Viking ship. Mm -hmm. And he's going around, have you seen that? The, well, I've seen the Draken Harald Harfager, which is the big one, and that's but that's that's definitely not one person. I mean, I'd say like one one zillionaire like funding it, but um, yeah, that is really cool. I was there to welcome it into the New York Harbor, and then I went on it. And there's a really awesome, pretty expensive, but really awesome like giant hardcover book about the making of it. And there's one detail from it that I just loved, which is get to source the trees. For the um, for the ship and and Viking shipbuilders and anyone building um, a big ship of this type, they actually found so there's there's a part of the ship that like connects the wall of the ship to the the bottom of the ship and it's called the knee, and they found a tree with a branch and trunk that was shaped the right way for all the knees. Now, and while they they were doing that, they got special permission to like look in a a Danish old growth forest that isn't usually logged and they had to go out there with a bunch of foresters to like make sure that they were taking down one that like could be spared. They found, I'm like, I love that. They found a Napoleonic era bullet in one of the trees that they took down because there'd been a Napoleonic era battle in that forest. And it's just like, cool. like history on top of history on top of history. Cool. So they left that in, it's in the, it's in, in the book. Yep. It was shocking to me is the size of it. It was, it's not huge. Yeah. 
And that one, um, the one of the other interesting things about that ship was it was built by real boat builders, people who build, whereas all the replica Viking ships that have been built before then have been built by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. And so based on, but like based on ships that they found that have probably settled and warped and things like that. So like a lot of them had a, um, had a curved keel, the replica ones, but, but this, but the, Harold Harf, Jock and Harold Harfager has a flat keel because the shipbuilders felt like it could have warped, the, the archaeological samples could have warped, and no one now would build a curved keel bow. And when they tested curved keels and like models, they didn't work. So, um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's amazing they made these voyages like to the New World, even in open boats. They think something like a third of the ships that, because a lot of, in this era, a lot of people were leaving Norway and Sweden and, um, and Denmark to settle in Iceland. And they think as many as a third of the voyages were lost. Mm -hmm. So it was really taking your life in your hands, deciding to make that voyage. And do you know how many people would be on a boat? A yeah. Like that? Um, never really more than a hundred, but often. Still, when you yeah. The, uh, the and animals probably, and did they take animals? On the horses, boats, um, probably not horses. I don't know to Iceland or not. Maybe maybe like small ponies or something. But yeah, it would be be kind of a nightmare. They did find that Vikings often had cats on their ships, which is not something I learned until I was writing book three. But there is a Viking ship cat in book three, so yeah. because I thought that was pretty cute. Yeah. Um, did it have like a symbol like? I don't. Th I don't think cats were like venerated the way they are in um, Egyptian mythology. But uh, the goddess, the fertility goddess Freya, her her cart is drawn by cats. So, <laughs> you know your <clears throat> engineering background. Where does it intersect with the writing? I think that um, so. As for the Sea Queen, I had to find a piece of software that would help me manage where everyone was at any given time and make sure that when someone got pregnant, they were pregnant for nine months and giving birth nine months later. And also, um, and I've, I've stretched this a little bit, but like the warring season was generally in the summer because there was a lot of ice otherwise. And so managing the um, people's, everyone's location, the weather, pregnancies, people's ages, like making sure that no one was in two places at once, that they could all like had time to get to the battle. So I joke that I was like project managing Vikings. Um, and, and I have this piece of software called Aeon Timeline, which was originally designed for project management, but they decided they, they started working with, with novel writers and it's really good for timelines and, and keeping track of things like that. And so I can say like, so and so gets pregnant, so and so gives birth nine months later, and even if I moved like the date of getting pregnant around, it's all tied so that the um, the giving birth like gets moved to. It's really helpful. It's called Aeon Timeline. I'm happy to email me if you want more information about it. It's like twenty dollars. It's well worth it. Uh, and and so I feel like a lot of the just kind of. Um, and novels read better if everything kind of proceeds in cause and effect in a way that is more, is a little false because a lot of things happen to us from day to day that don't have a cause that we can really see. Um, or, or, or certainly not an interesting cause. Like if, if God forbid I drove out the here and someone hit me, like that happens all the time, but it's not that interesting from a story perspective without it being motivated by character and all these things. And so I think having to think logically about a chain of cause and effect is something that, that doing engineering and doing computer programming has helped me, helped me do. But I also wanted to be an engineer so that I could fund my book buying habit. So I have always, <laughs> it, was, it was a mercenary decision of like, I would love to be an English major, but I know they don't get paid and I want to buy books. So, uh, yeah. So I always ask, um, or someone, usually you, always asks, as a child, did you read? Did your parents read to you? Mm -hmm. And you just did you read a lot? Yeah, they read. They read to us all the time, and lots of folk and fairy tales, which I think are really wonderful for for children. And um, but actually, I was. Um, I love being read to, but I had a little trouble reading at age like 
seven and eight and all my peers were kind of in the advanced reading group and they dropped me down to the less advanced reading group and it was great because I, I built my confidence and then then I became a voracious reader and I read all the time and um, I think the book that probably made me want to be a writer is I read Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Miss of Avalon when I was like 11 years old and um, I've read it many many times since then and it uh, because I'd run out of all the all the like appropriate books for my age in the house, and my mom, my dad was like, "Here's a 900-page book. It will probably shut her up for a little while," nice. <laughs> and it did. Uh, and it's made me really happy when I have do have some fans who are like 13 and 14, and like I would have loved these books when I was 13 or 14. There's there's some sex and violence, but nothing more than was in the Miss of Avalon, and um, yeah. nothing more than it's in a lot of young adult books these days. And the you know, I think they're geared towards adults, but the um, the main characters are are teenagers in the first book because that was the beginning of adulthood in the Viking Age, and so I think there's there's things to so if you have some advanced uh, teens and um, and so and some boys too, which is great because I know yeah. girls tend to be better bigger readers, but. Um, be interesting challenge, I would think, getting into the consciousness of a teenager who's actually an adult. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't know if that, if that was something you... I probably... But you know what I mean? Like, if you're really an adult, or yeah. like 16 in one era, but, you know, you're still a kid in another. One, one of the, I, you, I remember your bad reviews very, um, as a writer, much more than your good reviews, sadly. And one of my bad reviews was complaining about Ron, the bad life choices that Ron Vald makes. And I'm like... He's a teenager. Like it's a, he probably doesn't make enough bad life choices in the course of the book. So, um, so yeah. yeah. But I mean, he's also kind of a know-it-all teenager, which is what I was as well. So. <laughs> That's interesting. It's as if you triggered like a negative memory in that particular reviewer, and they were just like, "Oh no." Yeah. Which means you did. Something you did some really good writing then if it triggered an emotional reaction. Yeah. My my sister is like the only person who isn't a fan of Svanhild, who's the sister character, because she's like, younger sisters are so annoying. And she's a younger <laughs> sister, so I feel like she's <laughs> <laughs> And when I gave her the other Boleyn girl to read, right after that book came out, it was like it's very page turny. I gave it to her after I was done reading it. She was like, What are you trying to say about the sister relationship? <laughs> Like, I just thought it was good. I don't know, but you're right, I guess. It's about sisters who have a really weird relationship. <laughs> people project onto, um, yeah. I mean, that's a really cool thing about books is people, when someone gets into a book, they're bringing a lot of their own stuff to mm -hmm. it and kind of creating the world that, that you describe, but they're doing a lot of the work of creating it in their mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you're leaving quite a gap between first and second. Mm -hmm. and from second to third. Now, does that sort of give you opportunity later on to expand it for, you know, if, if it becomes very popular? You know, I probably, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably rather just leave that as an exercise for the for you know, people to imagine or fan fiction writers to write if they want to. Um, I really didn't want to, you know, I admire Diana Gabaldon a lot, but I also can't really understand how she maintains her interest in the exact same characters over seven, eight, nine books, which are, you know, these are fairly long, like averaging about 400 pages, 425. Um, her books are like eight, 900 pages. I really wanted to keep on doing different things. So I have the characters at different times. Yeah, at the first book, the second book, the, it's six years later, and the third book is 14 years after that. Um, I also, some of the events that I wanted to cover were, took place over that period of time. And, um, and I find it more interesting to write like about a really intense period in my character's life rather than kind of taking them through decades, where I'm sure you know, some dramatic things happen that I had to leave off the page. But like, in order to have a plot that really comes together, I wanted to, be, to choose a, a period of a, a year or two that was the most important for them. Yeah. But if I if someone wants to make it into a TV show, I will certainly consult on what might have happened in between, and the, and their writers can flesh that out if they like. Did you ever think about becoming a writing instructor or teacher? I would love to, and I am actually the reason that Shane is here is that we're trying to get together a um, some writing classes at the McConnell Center in Dover for the summer. I love teaching. I love editing people's stuff. I really would like to do more of it. I've. Um, 
If, if you guys didn't ask questions, I was going to joke that I like it when I talk to um, high school students because their teachers make them come up with questions to ask. Um, and so I've had a lot of fun talking with high school students. And I, I did re reach out to a teacher in Dover and ask if they wanted me to come in and do something, but didn't get back to me. So still looking for opportunities. That's yeah. Dover's yeah. hard to crack. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on it together. Um, yeah. So. So are you going to, do you have a writer's guild that you're um, starting, or is it just purely teaching? And a a um, colleague that we both share, um, Steve, he and I met initially with the idea of creating a more affordable workshops in the Seacoast. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of great workshops that are offered by like the Hampshire Writers Project, the MWPA, and the... Um, that place in Exeter whose name I always forget, but like sometimes when you're a working poet or writer or author or what have you, it's hard to get out to a workshop right. because of the fees, how right. much it costs. Right. So we're working on developing something that's more economically friendly for the Seacoast. And I have a workshop that I've done in sort of shorter settings that I want to expand for this, which is um, how to turn like the how to turn an idea into a novel with steps and different like ways to think about it. And I hate writing books that try to say that it's easy because it's definitely not. But I think there are ways of thinking about it that um, that can help create something that is has a coherent like characters, plot, and theme. And so I'm really hoping to be able to do that. But. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I am, I am selling and signing if you like, but I also understand if uh, now is not the time.